welcome, uh, particularly if you are uh, visiting, and we have the wonderful One Thing team. Can we have a cheer for them? Me. Well done. Um, we're part of a group of churches called Grace Connection, and uh, One Thing is the discipleship year that that is part of. And um, you are joining us um, in uh, the, the latter end of our uh, series. We've been looking at uh, the first two chapters of the Gospel of Luke. Um, the reasons for that were kind of obvious leading up to Christmas because that's the story of Jesus getting born and that's where we left the story the angels and the shepherds and all of that but we don't often get to see all of the story and so um, this week and then next week we'll finish it off we're just going to look at the rest of of chapter two um, and see what happened immediately after Jesus was born and then growing up into his adulthood okay I'm going to read Luke chapter two uh, verses 21 to 40 it's quite a big chunk uh, so bear with me on it Um, And if you have a Bible, uh, do have it in front of you so you can follow along. So at the end of eight days, that's eight days after Jesus was born, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus. The name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for their purification, that's Mary and Joseph and Jesus, uh, when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord as it's written in the law of the Lord every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord a pair of total turtle doves or two young pigeons now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon and this man was righteous and devout waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him and it had been revealed to him by the holy spirit that he wouldn't see death before he'd seen the lord's christ that is high stakes stuff isn't it (laughs) wow (laughs) and he came in the spirit into the temple and when the parents brought in the child jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law he took him up he took jesus up in his arms and blessed god and said Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. A light for revelation to the Gentiles, that is non-Jews, and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, by the way, This is a very important story. Never say this to a new mother. Okay. Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also. (laughs) Congratulations. So, So that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher, she was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She didn't depart from the temple, worshipping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And when they performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favour of the Lord was upon him. And this first verse, uh, verse 21 that I read, at the end of eight days he was circumcised and he was called Jesus, you actually might recognise from when we normally do our Christmas readings and the angels and the shepherds and then he was called Jesus Um, but we didn't do it uh, before Christmas we're doing it now partly because it fits this narrative a little bit better but also because I really wanted to point out that Luke has real made a real point dramatic point of of writing it in this way because all through the story with the shepherds and the angels the name Jesus isn't mentioned a surprise, right? Because you're like, oh, it's the story of Jesus being born. Surely you'd mention Jesus being born. But no, he's given titles like Saviour, 
uh, Messiah or Christ. Uh, he's of the line of David, which means he's a king. So Luke is painting this amazing picture of who this could possibly be. And then the, the punchline comes, he's called Jesus. And we knew this already because uh, the angel had, had said to Mary, uh, he's going to be called Jesus. So, you know, it, it wasn't really a surprise. Luke has given the game away. But this is the big kicker. He's saying, look, Jesus has come. And maybe you know what Jesus means. Yeshua is, the, is the, the Hebrew way of saying it, which is the same as Joshua, same as Elijah. And it means God saves. Yahweh saves. Jehovah saves. So who is this saviour? Who is this king? Who is this chosen one, this Messiah? It is Jesus, God who saves. And Luke, he's done this great thing of uh, he, throughout we've seen, hasn't we? He says one thing and he's kind of implying another. He's like, oh, that's the name that the, uh, the angel mentioned before he was born, before he was even conceived. Well, it helps us understand the dating of the conception. Sure, but what he's really telling us is that Jesus was his name even before he was conceived. Mm. Even before he was a man, Jesus, the third part of the Trinity, the second part of the Trinity, rather, was God saves that's who he is. He's a God who saves. Amen. Boom! This is why I didn't do it to the shepherds. I didn't want to get swallowed up. Because this is who Jesus is. Saviour, Messiah, King, God who saves. Ah, we could do Christmas all over again, couldn't we? <laughs> so they go up to the temple. Um, oh, sorry, yes. And he's, he's been circumcised at the eighth day, which is um, the same as John. We saw uh, John the Baptist. We saw a few chapters before. But some of the reason for that is, is tied up with this, this next part, which is why I put these two things together. Because it's part of um, the purification rites. Ooh. It's easy to read this stuff in the Bible, isn't it? And go, yeah, I don't know what that's about, so I'll skip on to the good stuff. But it's it's important thing, because it's it's based in uh, the book of Leviticus, um, which God's law uh, to, the, to the people of Israel. And women, mothers in the room... Thank you. Right on cue. My youngest is crying. Um, <laughs> this, bear with me on this one because this might be a little bit of offensive, but it, it really isn't. Um, immediately after giving birth, women were ceremonially unclean. <laughs> Rude, says my wife. <laughs> ceremonially unclean. It meant they weren't able to do things like circumcising, naming, and then going up to the temple. I actually see in this, not, <laughs> not God having a go at women, but actually probably giving them allowance for it. Imagine, right, you've had your baby, let's circumcise him, let's name him and get yourself up to the temple. No, I've just given birth, leave me alone. Okay, women are laughing, men are like, well, I don't see why that would be a problem. Um, but, but they're unclean because they've bled out, because bleeding has happened. I don't want to get too graphic on that, but that's what happens. Now, blood itself is not necessarily unclean. There is some stuff about that. But really, the, the issue is, so much of Leviticus and the law of God and the stuff in the Old Testament is about being holy. And by actually being whole, being complete. God is one. He is one. Yes, he's three parts. He's the Trinity, Father, Jesus, Spirit. We've talked about that already. But he's also one. He's perfect. He's complete. And when you have lost blood, you are incomplete. You are short of the glory of God. And so you aren't right to come before God. Now, hallelujah, we don't have to worry about this because Jesus, God saves. Yeah, he has died for us. We don't have to panic about that. I don't have to like not teach you the Bible every time I give blood. Because, it, you know, I'm not whole anymore. But rather... We, we can come before him right now. Amen. This is the good news, yeah? But for these guys, they were unclean. And so for a woman, the first seven days, you were demonstrably unclean. Um, uh, holy wise, hopefully someone's given you a bath. But you are, you are unclean, so you can't come. But on the eighth day, you start to enter this limbo period. And this is why they can do circumcision here. And so from day eight to day 40, there's this in-between time where you are purifying. Actually, a woman is healing at that point. She is, you know, I don't know enough biology to tell you, but something's going on with iron and red blood cells to say that you're repairing or you need a transfusion or whatever it is. 
but you are becoming whole again and so that you can come and be made pure. And, uh, and they come and they, they offer, um, oh no, and it says, of course, that uh, as it's written, this is why they had to present Jesus at the temple. Not every baby has to do this, but he was presented uh, to God as it's written in the law of God. Every male who first opens the womb should be called holy to the Lord. The firstborn, the first boy of every Jewish family had to be presented as an offering to God and say, he's yours. You, you have him, you do what you want with him. And the reason for this is actually not in Leviticus, but in Exodus, the story of, guess what? God saving, of Jesus, of Yeshua, of God setting his people free. They were in slavery, they were in captivity, and then to set them free, God put to death all the firstborn of of Egypt, but let go all the Israeli people, Israelite people. And so he said, right, and because of that, you give me all your firstborn. Seems a good deal. Seems a good deal. And to do this then, uh, to, to offer the purification, um, they offer, here we are, a bit more Christmas language for you, a pair of turtle doves, two turtle doves, and a partridge. No, they don't do that. Sorry, that's wrong. Uh, they give two turtle doves or a two pigeons. Some of you got that. Some of you are like, what is he talking about? Um <laughs> And there's a couple of reasons that's important. Because sometimes, again, you read this stuff and go, great, why are they killing birds? And I'm not sure I get this. On the night that they were set free, on the night that God saved in Exodus, they had to make a sign that, like, we're not the Egyptians, leave our firstborn alone. And what did they do? They put blood on their doorpost. And the blood came from what? A lamb. The people of God were saved by a perfect lamb whose bones weren't broken, who was dressed with bitter herbs, who was killed at the appropriate time, and they were set free. This is a picture of what Jesus would do. Let's not get too dark because, you know, he's a baby at this point, but that's why Jesus came. Because Yeshua, because Jesus saves, God saves Because he would go to the cross, our pure, perfect, spotless lamb, legs unbroken, tasting the bitter herbs, the bitter cup of death, separation from the Father, dying at twilight, the perfect image of the Passover lamb that was. And so in action of that, the the Jews had to come and, and offer that up. But a lamb was expensive. Again, I love God. Sometimes you read the law and go... Wow, what is all this stuff about women being impure and us having to kill animals and what's going on? But God has us in mind. Because the turtle doves, the pigeons, that's the pauper's offering. You're supposed to kill a lamb. But it says in the Old Testament, but if you can't afford a lamb, get some dirty old pigeons and I'll accept them. Because God is not interested in what we can offer. He's not interested in how rich we are. He's not interested in how well we can match up the picture of his salvation that would come. He's interested in saying, what have you got? Give it to me. I'll take it. And so they, they, they don't have a lot of money. And so they just get to take in some scadgy little pigeons and they're accepted and made pure. This is our story, isn't it? Hallelujah. Okay, I didn't want to spend too long on that one, but I, so I, uh, no, I'm going to skip over the burnt offering stuff. Ask me later if you're interested more about Levitical offerings, and I'll tell you some more. Okay, but then, and then, then this guy comes in, Simeon. What a story. Okay, God, one day, he was having a nice dream, maybe. The spirit woke him up and said, you're not going to die until you've seen the Christ. The all eternity has been waiting for. I don't know how I'd live with that pressure. Wow. But it happens. And, but uh, Luke is at pains to make sure that we understand he is a good eyewitness. Remember, Luke is writing this to Theophilus, who may have been a person. It also means beloved of Christ, so it could be every Christian ever, so that we know that this is reliable stuff. This is real history, that Jesus died, Jesus was born and then died, and Jesus saves. Hallelujah. Let's not get carried away with that again. Um, so he's making sure that we know he's a reliable source. He's devout. He's righteous. He's the right person to give a testimony and say, yeah, this is the good stuff. This is really the saviour. And he comes in. And we don't know how he recognises that Jesus is the one at 40 days old. I mean, babies are kind of lumps at that point. So I don't think I could. I can't tell a lot of my own children's photos between 40 days old. 
I love you. Um, but, <laughs> but, but, you know, how did he know? Of course, the Spirit spoke to him. I mean, maybe they said, what's his name? Jesus. Jesus? God saves? Maybe it's him. No, I think probably the Spirit would have given some uh, strength as well. But he says, God has opened my eyes. Opened my eyes to see the one who will save. We see a, a parent, like it's in, uh, if you've been following this along, and I'm sorry, I've banged on about this a lot. Luke does this thing where he's like, here's a story. Let me tell you a song that explains what that story is about. Or like a prophecy that, you know, Zechariah did it, Mary did it, the angels did it. And now Simeon, I don't know if he sings this thing, but he definitely brings, you know, six uh, couplets, three couplets, rather six lines of, of prophecy to explain what's going on. <laughs> Thank you, darling. Um, and he explains what's happening. Yes, this baby's come. Yes, he's been purified. But really what's happening, eyes will be opened. My eyes have been opened to see him. The Gentiles will have a light of revelation. Their eyes will be opened. That's what that means. He'd been waiting. He'd been waiting, uh, Luke tells us, for the consolation of Israel. Which is uh, something that doesn't really... I don't, I, every, I don't know about you. I've read this a hundred times and gone... Why did Israel need to be consoled? Yeah. Mm. Well, I mean, it goes back to the prophecy in Isaiah where he says, comfort, comfort, oh, my people, I will comfort you. I will come to you. But maybe it's helpful to you if, uh, if you know some Greek and if you don't, don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll explain it in a minute. But the word here for console is actually paraclesis. Does anyone know another way we use the word paraclesis? Don't feel afraid. I can say it back on the mic. Yeah, it's what we call the Holy Spirit. He is the paraclete. He is the comforter. He is the consoler. He's the one who comes alongside us. Simeon had been waiting for the consolation of Israel. He'd been waiting for the Holy Spirit. He didn't even realize it. And now he sees Jesus. And, and again, Luke is pointing forward to what's going to happen. Jesus is going to die. Jesus is going to get buried. Jesus is going to get resurrected. Jesus is going to ascend into heaven. And then we're going to receive the Spirit. The consolation of Israel is coming. Good stuff. And so rightly, then, uh, says his father and mother marveled at what would be said about him. Yeah, I'd say so. I mean, sometimes it's thought that, oh, you know, Mary pondered what the shepherds had said. And she's like, oh, yeah, I kind of understand now that, that Jesus is a gift to us. He probably will die. That will be nice. I'm pleased for my son. Um, you know, I, but this passage tells me that she's still trying to figure this out. <laughs> I mean, maybe if I, I, I've never given birth, I've never conceived a child. Maybe, you know, if you did and it, there was no father and it was by the Holy Spirit, maybe you should have a bit more of an awareness of who Jesus is going to be. I think we can give her a bit more grace than that, don't you? It's your baby. You don't expect him to be Yeshua, God who saves. But they marvel, they wonder. And again, it's really fascinating that do you remember right there, I know some of you weren't here, but right back at the beginning of this Luke series, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, got to go into the temple, right, and light the incense, which is a, the prayers of God, that goes up to God, yeah? And outside the temple, there were loads of people, what were they doing? Praying. Praying for deliverance, praying for salvation, praying for the consolation of Israel. Actually, Simeon is one of those people. Luke's putting flesh and bones on some of that slightly more abstract telling earlier. He's saying it's one of the, he's one of those guys. And they've been praying that, that Israel, Judah, would be set free from Roman rule. They don't like it. And now, finally, they see Jesus in the centre of Judaism, the centre of Israel. And what does he say? This gospel's for everyone. This is for the Gentiles. It's for the whole world. It's mad, isn't it? And don't forget, Luke is the person who also wrote Acts. So he's probably queuing you up for that a little bit. And then we get this second reliable source. Again, Luke's really keen to do this because previous to that, who have been our sources? Some angels. Well, how do you prove that, Luke? <laughs> and some shepherds. Well, I don't really trust them as far as I can smell them. That's, <laughs> that's generally Jewish thought. So then he's like, right, a devout, uh, righteous man, and then a woman who can trace her lineage back to Asher. Even though those tribes got lost, she is clearly a good source. She comes in, 
And uh, yeah, we, we see that actually she is a an image. Oh, I'm sorry, I've jumped forward. I've forgotten the sword that pierced the heart. Let's not skip over that. Ooh. But Anna comes in, and, uh, and she's, again, looks at pains to demonstrate as a reliable source, and then she goes and tells people. Whether she's heard Simeon or she receives a prophecy for herself, she is a prophetess after all. She recognises Jesus, 40 days old, as Yeshua, God who saves, and then goes and tells other people. There's an appetite. There's people praying at the temple and like, it's here. Anyway, let's go back to the awkward bit, shall we? <laughs> Behold, says Simeon, this child, 40 days old, is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. We've seen this kind of division, haven't we? Again, I told you, Luke does narrative song, narrative prophecy, whatever it is. You like story, let me tell you what it's about. And in those, we've seen this division, haven't we? Between the meek and the proud. God exalts, lifts up the humble. He casts down the proud. And he does this through Jesus, who rises and falls. That's what's happening here. He is the sign that this will happen and he will be opposed. Or at least that's one reading of it. You could read it as two groups of people, you know, like the sheep and the goats. Those who believe the sign and those who don't. Those who live in light, those who live in darkness, those who are humble, those who are proud. Or they could all be the same person. Because actually the Christian story is not, hey, I've run into Hannah, she is one of the light. I could, you, I'm sorry to say, Alicia, I won't say it, that's not fair. <laughs> you know, that's not how the world works. How do you become a Christian? How do you know that you're one of the chosen? Actually, by falling in humility. Falling on your knees. Falling in worship. And being raised in resurrected glory. And being raised like Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel. Our job as Christians, our chief role, is to fall at his feet yeah. and worship him as Simeon and Anna do. Yeah. And he says, great, let me lift you up. What have you brought? Some scaggy old pigeons? Mm. Stand to your feet, son, daughter. Mm. You're mine. That's a nice bit. And then a sword will pierce through Mary's soul also. Well, I'll say at this point, I wrote in my notes, what is this about? <laughs> I then read some of the commentaries and they basically went, yeah, we don't know for sure. It, can pro it probably means one of two things. It probably means one of two things. And, and we don't have to worry too much about getting this right because the Bible doesn't make it totally clear. So... It's not that bothered about us working it out. But it means one of two things. Either Mary actually has to go through that process herself. Just because she's the mother of Jesus doesn't mean she just gets to rise. She has to fall first too. Or, I think this is probably more likely, no, she is starting to put this together. That her son, her baby, in her arms is going to be the crucified Christ. That would pierce my soul. That would hurt. She's got a hard lot, actually, Mary. Either way, Jesus' role is that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Whether it's Mary, whether it's us, we're seeing here that all of us have to give an account. This is where the sheep and goats language that I'm referring to comes from. There will come a day when each of us will stand before Jesus and every thought we've ever had, everything we've ever done will be laid bare. I am not looking forward to it. <laughs> and the scales will be presented before us and we say, you know, were you a good person? Were you a bad person? What are you going to be, a sheep or a goat? Are you going to be light or darkness? And every single one of us should be afraid on that day unless we know Jesus. Mm. The one who took the punishment, the crucified lamb, 
who says, come with what you have and I will accept you and wipe the record clean and you will be accepted. The sword of division will come. Which side will you be on? It's entirely based on Jesus and what he's called you to be. Are you going to be his? There's the question for us today. And then they go away, uh, verses 39 and 40. And Luke, again, is, is at pains to say they did everything according to the law. If we haven't had it spelled out already for us with pigeons and turtle doves, he's like, no, 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 they've done everything fine. Again, he's trying to say, look, they're good Jews. It's all fine. Jesus wasn't a rogue. It's good. But also don't forget that Luke is the one who uh, is going to go on to write Acts, where in Acts 15 we're told we don't need to be circumcised anymore. Where we don't have to worry about whether we burn pigeons or lambs or snakes or owls. We can eat whatever we like now. Mm. You know, this is, he's setting some of the stage for Luke 2, which is Acts, which is where we are today. Mm. And that is kind of that. Next week, we're going to see Jesus as a boy returning to the temple um, and see what he gets up to. Uh, again, it will be Passover. Um, but right now, let's just uh, just close our eyes. In a minute, we're just going to break into uh, little groups and we'll work out what that is in a minute. And ask, you know, the questions that, that are being asked of us here. What does it more mean for us to fall so that we may be raised? What do we need to give up so that we can be like Jesus? What does he want to do within us? How does he want to make us um, righteous and devout like Anna and Simeon are? So that we can reach out to all the world as the promise is here. God wants to work in you so that his message goes out. That all may come. That everyone around the world might get to know Jesus. God who saves. Lord Jesus, we thank you. There are no limits to your salvation. No limits to your love. You are God who saves. Amen. And all we have to do is accept you. Mm. I pray, Jesus, that we would put everything aside and accept you. Yeah. Put every choice we make, every thing we live with aside and say, no, I, I want to do it your way. I want to give you everything. And we pray, would you send us to teach others the same?